Well, praise God. How y'all doing today? Good afternoon. Good evening. Praise God. This is midweek service. We're so thankful for Jesus and everything he's done for us and everything he's going to do for us. Praise God. Well, don't forget, if you're going to drop off your tithes at the church, drop them off in the slot in the door and they'll fall into a box. And if you're going to mail your tithes, <clears throat> then just mail them to the house. Praise God. And we'll get them. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Praise God. Well, let's receive the Wednesday night offering, tithes and offerings. Those of y'all that are faithful, thank you for being faithful. Those of y'all that ain't been faithful, repent and get faithful. Hallelujah. You got to be faithful to your giving, especially in these times we're living in right now. The uncertainty that's around us in this world, but we know God is certain, and we can read his word, and we can be uh, rejoice and be glad because we know he knows what's happening he knows what's going on and we know he knows what's what we should do and how we should do it and when we should do it and he'll tell us exactly what to do if we'll just listen and pay attention to him and what he wants to do hallelujah well just lift your offering up father we thank you for these offerings we present them to your kingdom and your glory father we're so thankful that you take care of us and that every need is met through christ jesus um, we give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise God. We'll turn to <clears throat> 2 Timothy and chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to talk about verses really uh, probably 1 through 5 if we get through with them. If we don't, then we'll extend it on to Sunday. But this is talking about difficult times right now. <clears throat> uh, right, uh, we're living in them right now. Difficult times. So. <clears throat> this is going to be talking about the times we're living in. Hallelujah. And we, we know that it says in verse 1, But know this, hard times will come in the last days. And you know, Paul wrote this over 2,000 years ago to Timothy. And we know back 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John, he wrote in, you know, for us to pray, Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, in Revelation 20. 20 John actually thought he was living in the last days he Paul expected he would be alive when Jesus came back you know the disciples expected that Jesus was coming back before they left the world they were they, they thought they were living in the last days right then and we know now 2,000 years later we know they were wrong they wasn't in the last days but 2,000 years later we're closer than they were but are we wrong? What, 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 when is Jesus coming back? What, what, what does this pertain to? And how can we find out? And there's, there is identifying marks, you know, that we can look to in the Scripture and see when Jesus is closer and closer and closer and closer. And we know, you know, through the prophecy in the Bible and things that have been passed out, we know we're in the last days. We are, we are so close to the return of Jesus' days. We know he is coming back real soon. But Paul started this off by saying, you know, hard times. Another place says that we are in dangerous days. Paul described the last days as perilous times in some versions of the Bible. And the word perilous means difficult, troublesome, trying, uneasy, hard, violent, threatening, and dangerous. Now, we can, look, we can turn on the TV right now and turn the news on, and we know we're living in dangerous times. Right now, it's difficult to live in these times, troublesome, trying. It's uneasy. It's hard. My goodness, it's, it sure is violent out there and threatening and dangerous, and people are just following their own what they want to do. It shows us really how wicked people are in their self without Christ. The answer to all this is Christ. But if they won't turn to Christ and do what he wants them to do and follow him, then we know they're, uh, they're, they're going to continue to follow their evil ways. They may put off, you know, that they're a good person and all this, but what happens when they get squeezed? What happens when the world closes in on them? What happens when their family fights back at them? What comes out of them then? When a Christian squeezed, they should ooze out with Jesus and how much he loves people and how much he loved them and took their sin away, and they didn't deserve it. Amen. So Jesus should always ooze out of us. So we, when you see this definition of perilous times and um, dangerous days, we know that when you turn on TV, they got to be upon us with all this going on right now. Hallelujah. While there's characteristics that mark these time periods, you know, 
uh, to some extent, we can study these characteristics. We're going to study them in a minute of all the things Paul said would be going on. I think there's 18 of them all together that he said. I st but, you know, I think it's safe to say that as we describe our own times as perilous, what, what we're seeing going on in our society right now, what's happening in our society, surely they're perilous. Remember, perilous means difficult, troublesome, trying, uneasy, hard, violent, threatening, and dangerous. Surely we can look at the times we're living in right now and we can say that those times that we're living in are perilous, dangerous. And we're, we're going to look at it in verse you know, 2 through 4. It tells you know, different characteristics of our time. We're living in an age of dangerous time for men and women that are living for God. Because they're going to come against us. You, right now, it, it really ain't, ain't that bad, you know, because you got people in church that are trying to act like they're Christians. But the, the line's drawn, and pretty soon you're going to see who really is a Christian and who really ain't. And those people that really ain't Christians that go to church all the time and think they know everything about God, when they really see that they ain't a Christian, and they, they'll start attacking the ones that say they are a Christian by saying things holier, you think you holier than me and all this stuff, and I always respond, I hope I am the way you're acting, but praise God, we need to love people, take their sin away, they don't deserve it, just like Jesus did. And we'll see people's true colors come out. We'll see them come out in these last days. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're living in an age when dangerous times are here. Those who pr practice righteousness are called tolerant. I mean, in in intolerant. When you practice righteousness, you're intolerant. They don't want to have nothing to do with you. Bigoted, narrow-minded, antisocial, and are labeled dangerous. While those who practice deviant, sinful lifestyles are praised and labeled by society as heroes. Man, we, just knowing that, we know we're in dangerous times. We're in the last days. We're in very dangerous days right now. They take the people that sin and walk totally against what the Bible teaches. They take them and make them men to be heroes. God takes them and says He's coming back to judge them. And if they're not in Him, they're going to be found uh, guilty of sinning against him and he's going to say depart from me I never knew you what the world looks at it is great God don't look at it as great when the world looks at something great and that's evil and it walking in sin God don't look at that as great it's defiant it's against him it's against holiness so we got to look at him and see what he says the we may wonder why these days might Factoring in God's plan for the world. How is it factoring in while God is not the author of evil? He has determined to abandon sinful man to his choices of a life of wickedness. God has chosen to abandon man to let them do what they want to do. He, we're not robots. He's not going to make us do what uh, <clears throat> He wants us to do. If, it, if He could, it would, just, it would be wonderful right now in this land. You wouldn't see no fighting and all this going on on the TV in these dangerous times, unruly times, people doing what they want to, walking in evil. You wouldn't see all that if God had us as puppets because we'd be doing righteousness and He would be making us do it. But He gives us to our, our own choice and we have a choice. If we want to live in a life of wickedness, God will let you live in that life. And it's an effort to expose man's sinfulness and his wretched condition. God is trying to expose who man really is. Man, and that's why a man is desperately in need of a righteous God. Man, we need God more than ever right now. The condition of humanity and society in the last days is absolute proof that man left to himself will ruin everything he touches. Just watch man walking in wickedness and on the on the TV screen, you see they're destroying everything. It's like a path of destruction. It's like a third world country, and you you in America. So we got to learn to follow Jesus and do what He says. You know, and me, me no matter how much we want this world to change, and society to change, y'all. No matter how much we want it to improve and be better, we are going to continue to see society decay and fall away more and more from God. We're going to see them walk away from Him. You're really going to see a line drawn where the, the, 
Christians that are holy and righteous are going to be ridiculed and the ones that want to go to church and say they're Christian, they're going to be praised. So we got to really know who we are in Christ. You know, we, through our prayers and things, we may be able to, 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 to move you know, the decay of the society where it's just in parts of here and there and over there in certain parts. It's for God, but it's because of the prayers of people. But for the most part, society is going to decline until we see the return of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ returns to this world and rules us in righteousness and power, then we're going to know Natural man, instead of getting better spiritually, is actually growing more and more wicked, according to Ephesians 4:22. We know that. So the, it's not going to get the world is not going to get better and more righteous. It's going to get worse and decay. But through the prayers of people praying, it appears sometimes that certain places are are more righteous and holy. And uh, but the world in a whole is decaying. It's got to for Jesus to return. And I'm praying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But I'm also praying, Lord, while I'm here and the church is here, let us live a quiet and peaceable life. And that's why I pray for my presidents, governors, and mayors, so we can live a quiet and peaceable life. You know, in, in Daniel 12, 10, it tells us the wicked shall do wickedly. Wicked people are going to live wickedly. They're going to live wickedly. The wicked is spreading throughout this whole world. But we wicked all wickedness also was in religious circles where people like sold out for God and they're just playing a game. Hallelujah. But we know we see in verse two it says, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, verse three, unloving, irreconcilable. Slanderers without self-control, brutal without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So we see there, if you count them out, that was that's 18 characteristics of the way people are in the world. Hello. Paul describes these kind of peoples that live during the last days. He tells us how they will think and how they will live. How they think and how they, they will live. Oh, you just got to read these verses right here and cross-reference them with the newspaper, the news on TV, the life around us that we see it, that are going on. And we can see those these characteristics are being fulfilled in the world today right around us. And a lot of times it's being fulfilled in people right in the church. These characteristics are in the church because people don't want to walk in holiness. They want to walk what they want to walk. You can preach the Word and their ears are closed to hearing the Word. I'm talking about the truth. The truth about Jesus. He said, I am the, the way and the truth and the life. That's who He is. So we got to get the truth from Him, not from somebody that ain't living for Jesus. Life all around us we see, we're surrounded by these characteristics and so let's just look at these characteristics and see, do you see any of that in your life today, in the life around you? Do you see any of it in your church, in your uh, workplace, people around you, how they talk today? What, what's going on? Well, what's going on to me is we're in the last days, and we can turn on the TV, look at the newspaper, look on the Internet, and search out things, and you'll see that we're in the last days because all this stuff is happening right now. The first one it talks about, it says they're lovers of self. What is lovers of self? It's selfish. The intent and the purpose here is just on what one wants, what you want, on your own interests. And you can read in Philippians 2, 3, nothing is more important to some people than themselves. Nothing's more important to some people than them. Hello, you got to really watch people that are selfish and looking out for only their self because they are wicked in their self. And you got to watch them and be careful. They, these people feel as if the world revolves around only them and them alone. You, you ever met anybody like that? 
The world revolves just around them. The world revolves around them. If they wouldn't hear, it, it, there wouldn't be no sense in us even living or the world existing. They, they, they literally setting themselves up as their own little God. See, when people walk in their love of self, they make their self out to be their God. So they follow their self and do what they think is right. <laughs> when love for self... So really what we see here is when love for yourself is elevated, where yourself, your most important, more important than anything else in your life or in life, then the love for God and the love for others is lowered. So you see yourself as more important than anybody in your world, in this world, or in the world to come. You're more important than anybody. You're, you're your own God, your own hero. You, you know more than anything or anybody. Hello. Praise God. Well, you need to get that selfishness out of you. you. Really, what you are is your own little God, and you, you got to get rid of that to where you ain't, because you, you're really not as poor as you think you are. Uh, that's wisdom. Hallelujah. The trend in the modern church, you know, today is made towards self-esteem, self-worth, a positive self-image. All concepts, all these concepts that they talk about are borrowed from a modern, sacred, uh, modern secular society a modern secular society philosophy teaches you that that you you know you got to be this and that yourself you got to put yourself up you got to make yourself important well god wants to take uh, us out of self he wants to take self out of us he's trying to get rid of self deny yourself Get rid of this. I'm dead. I no longer live. That's what God's trying to get you to. He's trying to get you to Galatians 2.20. <laughs> I'm in Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ liveth in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. He's trying to get rid of the flesh. And these modern-day psychologists and modern-day churches are trying to make you feel good about yourself and build yourself up. No, you need to build yourself in Christ. Amen? You need to show people who Christ is. Praise God and follow Him. Hallelujah. And we'll, we'll find, you know, every one of these characteristics that we're about to talk about start with being a lover of yourself. It stems from that. It grows from that. Like when you read in Galatians, and it talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 19, 20, and 21. I believe all that, that's all three of those. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And we, you know, we're taught all the ones after that really stem from love. You ain't going to have no joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, meekness, gentleness, kindness, self-control if you don't have love. you got to have the fruit of love growing in your life to have all the rest of that. Well, here... If you if you got the rest of these in you, then it all started with you. But you was a lover of yourself. You're number one to yourself. Uh, when, you, when you're not content with no second place business, you, when you hear that out of First Corinthians chapter thirteen, when you talking about love and says you're content with second place, uh, not no, you just that, that, that don't even that don't even register with you because you're number one. Hello, you're the number one. I, everything starts and ends with your existence. That's, that's the where you put yourself. <laughs> and, and you can't be, when, when a person is a lover of their own self, you can't be caught off guard by the depths of evil in which that person is capable of doing. When a person is a lover of itself, man, they can, they can do some evil stuff. Why? Because they're just protecting self. They don't care about nobody else. <laughs> so as we study these, keep that in mind. You know, that God wants to, he wants to get self out of us. Hello, and people that do these things are really are they just lovers of themselves? So they're very dangerous to be around. Very dangerous to to hook yourself up with a lover of its uh, of themselves because they will cut you, stab you in the back, cut you off in, in an instant to protect themselves. They got to get rid of themselves. You got to man. You got to confess every day. I deny myself. I take up my cross and follow Him. I'm content with second place. I always do those things that are pleasing to Christ. Well, the only way you're going to do that is get rid of yourself. Hello. So we know the first one is lover of, lovers of self. They, they're God, they've made their self into a God. Uh, the second one here that we, we, we're going to look at and, 
it says lovers of money, and over here uh, is covet, covetness, lovers of money. You know, God's plan, that the, God's plan was that we worshipped Him, that we worship God, worship Jesus, led by the Holy Ghost. Amen. He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to love other people. And He wants us to, to use things for His kingdom and to bless people. That's what God wants us to do. So He wants us to, He don't want us to walk in covetousness, lovers of money. He just wants us to know that we're in His kingdom and we got our priorities straight and we're, He's in the right place He should be and He will take care of every need we would ever have. Amen. When our priorities become messed up, you know, then we should not be surprised as the depths of evil which we are capable of walking in because we become a covet, a coveter of money, a lover of money. So you got to be careful and watch people. So when our priorities get messed up, we start worshiping ourselves, ignore God, love things, and use other people. That's when you become a lover of money. You use other people. You look, th 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 this is a formula for defeat in life. When you follow this, uh, this, this formula of loving money and being covetous and wanting everything everybody else is guiding, instead of being content of who you are in Christ and believing that He's going to bless you and take care of you, but you become a lover of money and a covetous, covetous person, then you better believe, get ready, you're walking in a formula for, of death, a defeat in your life. Man, Jesus wants to take all this junk out of us, but we got to repent and get right with Him so He can do in us what He wants to do. And number three here we see is boastful or boasters, empty pretenders. <laughs> it's empty pretender, windbags. Windbags is what these people are. Brag about what they have and what they've done. Set themselves up as the all in all of other people's lives. In other words, I, man, I'm the best thing you could be around. I'm the best friend you could ever have because of me. Uh, the world's better. Because of me, everything's doing great. Because of me, we're walking in this. We're walking in that. Now, you better give all praise to Jesus Christ and Him crucified in your life when things are looking good and going good. You better give Him the praise and the glory that He deserves. Amen? Not yourself. Don't be a boaster of self and what you can do. Be a boaster of Jesus Christ and what He has done. Amen. This is the difference in these people walking in difficult times and making themselves out to be something they ain't and somebody who is Christ walking and following Christ. It's a total opposite of, of, of what is reigning inside of me and you as Christians. The fruit of the Spirit is in us. Hallelujah. And it should be reigning and ruling. People should be able to see it in us. Hallelujah. What's the next one? Well, the next one is proud and proud. It, really, what proud is, is you, you have overestimated what you're worth. You you think more highly of yourself than you ought to. If we could really see ourselves for who we are, we would see who we really are. And without Christ, we are nothing. Hello, nothing. We are nothing without Jesus but sinners saved by a pure grace. I used to be a sinner. I got saved, and now I'm a saint in Christ. But if I'm following these characteristics and they're ruling and reigning in my life, I still ain't in Christ. This is ruling and reigning in me. I'm more, think more, I'm more of myself than I, that I don't even need Jesus. That's what a lot of people that become this way believe. They don't need a God. Man, they are God. They can take care of their own self. Take care of Do what they want to. Hallelujah. In, in, in uh, Romans 12.3, it says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to God have dealt to every man a measure of faith. So what does that tell me? Well, John 5, 15, 5 says we're nothing without Him. So we are nothing without Jesus Christ. We can't do nothing without Him. So you need to get all that pride out of you because pride shouldn't be in somebody that's a Christian born again following Christ. You ought to know you're nothing without Him. And you're not going to walk in pride. You're not going to overestimate yourself. I know some of us, we we really content and think we're something and all this stuff, but you know if you you can't really believe that. You can't believe that you're something. Without Him, you're nothing. 
Hallelujah. You can't believe, I, man, I'm, I'm this and that. No, you ain't this and that. Nothing without Jesus. Jesus is the one that made you like that. Hello, the next one we see here is demeaning, or, or it means a blasphemer. Are you demeaning or blaspheming? That means giving to defiant and bitter words. You, you use your mouth to tear people apart. And you, you, instead of building people up, you tear them apart. These are people that speak evil of God. Speak evil of His children. Speak evil of His work. <clears throat> and have you, have you seen people in our day, how they rise up? Man, they ain't ashamed today to curse God, to curse what He does, to say He's nothing, that He's there ain't no God. They're not ashamed of that no more. What is the truth? Hello, they, they just, because men has lost his respect for God and themselves and their fellow man. They've lost respect. That's why they're blasphemers. They're blaspheming against God. They don't have no respect for nobody. I don't know what's happened in their life. The devil's done something in their life to cause them to turn against God. Well, what do we got to do? Pray that the eyes of understanding be open. They see the love of Christ, the height, depth, breadth, and length of His love for them. When I turn on the TV and I see the protesters, now that's what I pray. Lord, let their eyes be open to the understanding of what Jesus, how much He loved them. Reach them. Don't let them go to hell. We got, we got to pray for these people that God will take care of them and watch over them and bring them you know, to, to Him. Hallelujah, especially in the last days because they have no respect for their fellow man. They have no respect for God. And they surely have no respect for property. They, they don't have no respect. They think nothing of using their tongues to speak evil against everyone and everything. Man, you've got to watch these people. Man, they, use their, they tear down people with their tongue. Their tongues are wicked. They're, they are sharp. Their tongues are sharp to mess you up. You know, when I was growing up, you know, and you growing up, you heard the same thing. Sticks and stones will break my bone, but words will never hurt me. We found that out to be a lie. Sticks and stones may hurt your body, but that'll heal. But words spoken out of a person's mouth to tear somebody else down, sometimes they go a lifetime and into eternity. So, so words do hurt you. And they can hurt you for eternity if you don't get to Jesus and let Him heal you. And let Him take that away from you because He loves you. Hey, and we see this now, disobedient to parents. Man, this is running rapid in the church, running rapid everywhere. People don't want to make their children mind. They think if they whoop them, they're going to kill them. But no, uh, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. That's in the Bible. It's taught by in the Bible by Solomon. If Solomon had 700 wives and 300 girlfriends, Daniel will tell you how many children he had. And he said, if you spare the rod, you'll spoil the child. He said a, a child left to itself will be an embarrassment to the mother. And so we ought to learn that uh, you have to raise children in the admonition of the Lord so they won't depart from Him. And sometimes you have to correct them to do that because if you don't correct them, you don't love them. That's what the Bible teaches, not Pastor Robert. Because the Father said He only corrects us because He loves us. And he says, if you don't correct the children, your children, you don't love them. Man, some people think they're being great parents because they don't never whoop their kids or, or correct them. No, you ain't no great parent. You're just a, a friend of that person. You become a friend of that child because you don't correct them and stand in the parent role of telling that child you're wrong. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Disobedience of parent. The rejection of Christian value. Values reaches into the home. Christian values will reach into the home, but the rejection from these children, they reject the Christian values if you don't enforce them with love. you got to enforce this stuff with love. Love's got to be behind everything. Man, you can't just tell a child, do this and do that, and you ain't doing this and doing that. You can't tell them to follow Jesus and don't smoke, don't drink, don't cuss, don't, and you do it in front of them. That's why you got a lot of disrespect and disobedient to parents because parents ain't lived in the role of following Jesus. Doing what Jesus says. And showing that kid that you can follow Jesus Christ. You can do what Jesus says. Hallelujah. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Man, read that. Let your children read that. Discipline's gone out the wind nowadays. Even our government teaches and tries to put on people that get foster kids and stuff, but you can't whip them and you can't do this one, you can't do this. No, that's what them kids need is some good discipline to straighten them out, praise God. If, if children will not respect and obey their parents, who will they respect? 
And if they don't respect their parents, that's why you see all kids out over that don't respect nobody because they don't respect their parents that started at home. Man, you got to respect your parents and follow your parents and do what they say when they're following Christ, and then you will respect other people. You will be uh, out there and be respectful to people when you come in contact with them. Man, I, I say, I still say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, to people that some are younger than me. That's just part of my language. That's just what I was taught. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Man, nowadays, you ask a kid something a lot of times, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, that's right, yeah, no, uh-uh, don't do it. There ain't no yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. They have to be taught that at home to respect mom and dad and say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am to them, and you'll see them do that out in public. They'll have respect when they're out in public. If there is no obedience, respect, and loyalty in the home, why should we think we're going to find that in society? And if they ain't out there, if you if it ain't in your house and they're respecting you and they're, uh, uh, you know, a, a, just a wonderful child, they bring you, bring you happiness and joy, and you can go anywhere with them and take them anywhere, the grocery store or anything, and they're just so respectful and do what you say. <clears throat> That's a child that you need to praise. The ones that you that they act like they are at home or may not even be at home. That's the ones you need to whoop and discipline. Take them out to a grocery store and they act like a fool. That's the ones you need to take home and discipline. Amen? Instead of letting them do what they want to. You need to take them home and discipline them. Amen? Well, praise God anyway. Hallelujah. Praise God. you got to discipline them children. Raise them up in the admonition of the Lord. That's what me and you have to do. We have to do what Jesus taught, what He said, and what He did. Praise God. Number seven is unthankful. Do you see a generation out there and people and kids and, and uh, young adults and adults walking around, they're so unthankful, no sense of gratitude for anything they possess. They think they've done it all for themselves. No, I made this for me. God had nothing to do with this. You had nothing to do with this. I've done this myself. All, all stems from, from lovers of self. It all stems from that. Man, whether it came from man or God, they don't care. First Thessalonians 5.18 shows us our society, our society is marked by this. It's marked by this unsettled unthankfulness. People complain about everything and everyone. Yet God's Word teaches us that we should be a thankful people in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. You know, we should be thankful in all things. Thankful in all things. So don't walk around being, when somebody does something for you, thank them. They didn't have to do it. They didn't have to take you to lunch. They didn't have to take you to dinner. They didn't have to buy you breakfast. Uh, hello, they didn't have to give you no gift at Christmas. They didn't have to give you a gift at your birthday. They didn't have to just be thinking about you and send you something. Just, I'm thinking about you. They don't have to do that, so be thankful. Always be a thankful person and thank people for what they've done in your life and thank people for how, they, how they've come through and showed you how much they love you. Just be thankful instead of being unthankful and ungrateful. Man, follow, learn to follow Jesus and quit being ungrateful and unthankful. That, you know, in the, the, the Bible, you know, that I'm reading the Christian Standard Version, it, it says ungrateful. The King James says unthankful. It's the same thing. Ungrateful, unthankful. Don't, don't really uh, care about thanking people for nothing. Well, you should have gave it to me because I, I, you know, I'm the best thing in your life. Come on now, my goodness, when you got that kind of attitude, get ready. It's going to be difficult for you, especially in eternity, because you don't know Jesus Christ. Because if you knew Him, you'd be thankful at all times. Hallelujah. Thankful at all times. Praise God. Give glory to Him. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory be to God. Number eight is uh, in here is unholy. And it's the same in just about every Bible. Unholy, it means wicked. Unholy is wicked. Uh, and when you look it up, the word means profane. Man, this is a, a bad situation to be in, is to be an unholy person. Because the Bible tells us we ain't going to see God unless we are walking in holiness and peace with all man. Man, so when you're unholy, you ain't going to see God. You're far away from Him. It's a state of the heart when men lose all regard for decency and shame. They lose regard, man. They don't care. It can be shameful, shameful acts, just crazy stuff out there on the Internet and TV. But it, it don't even faze them because they've become unholy. 
in their lifestyle. It don't faze them when people do things that are wrong. They're governed by their passions and they are blind to modesty, decency, purity, and righteousness. They think they can do whatever they want to and there's no shamefulness to it. Wear anything. The, the Bible teaches women to, to dress, you know, dress pure and holy. People come in this unholiness, man, they dress crazy stuff. They, sexuality is sold in all kind of products. Women just wear whatever they want to in the, in the street, showing their body. You ain't supposed to show your body as a woman. And you're supposed to, God says, keep it, uh, keep, dress modestly. Not, man, women out there in yoga pants, pajamas, you know, br no, no bras, just shirts that hang down, show their breasts. That ain't dressing in modesty, that's dressing unholy. Praise God, you're supposed to dress modestly what the Bible teaches. You ain't supposed to be out there using your body for sexuality and sending, you know, and making, trying to make men want you and lust after you. I didn't want your body was, your body was given to you for your husband. You're supposed to, to protect your body, watch over it, keep it holy until your husband, till that night when you're with him. And then he's supposed to keep himself holy until that night he's with you. That's what the night of the marriage is supposed to be. The wife is holy. The husband's holy. They've kept themselves for each other. Now, if you've messed up and got away from God, then you just repent, get the blood of Jesus, and apply that and start living holy today. Hallelujah. Don't be unholy and walk before God. Just like when, you know, you see on the Super Bowl halftime. You remember uh, <clears throat> Timberlake? Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson, when they was on there, all kind of sexually explicit things, you know, flowing wickedness and evil. It's so rampant in our society. When Beyonce was on there and she laid down and all that stuff, and she said she felt things come in. Well, they did. It was demons. You turned away from God and turned to, to, to the things of this world, the things that are not of this world. Hello, don't be flaunting yourself and thinking you're something. Men will increase in wickedness as the end approaches. It's going to happen. It's going to get worse and worse. It's, the, the trend of being wicked will come more and more evident. You'll see it more evident in, in people's lives that they, they have turned to, to, to not, not to God. They may say something about Him. The ones in the church are the ones that are most dangerous when they live in this unholiness, but they go to church and try to make you think there's something there ain't. That's the most dangerous ones. when they live. The bottom line is that Men will hold nothing as being sacred anymore. Are we there yet? We're getting real close, aren't we? That they're living and not holding anything sacred anymore. That's what's happening in people's lives right now. Are we, we're getting close. If we ain't there, we're getting real close to it. Well, let's stop there for Wednesday night, and you know we'll finish this on Sunday. And praise God, man! I just like this, enjoy this when you just study out what. Each one means and word means. Praise. This is more of a teaching, but it got me, getting me excited. Hallelujah. Man, we just thank the Lord for everything He's done for us and going to do. If anybody out there needs to give your whole life to Jesus, maybe we, we've just been through eight things so far out of 18 through these three verses. And man, if, if you've seen where you're living like that, you need to change and give your whole life to Jesus. If that's you, just say, Father God, forgive me right now. I come to you as a sinner. But thank God today I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ. I confess out of my mouth He is my Lord. I believe in my heart, God, You raised Him from the dead. And according to Your Word, I am born again. I am saved. Now, Father, I thank You as I have believed in You and confessed Jesus my Lord, believed that You raised Him from the dead. I'm going to continue in the words of Jesus, His doctrine. And I know that that will make me His disciple indeed. So I'm going to follow that. I'm going to hook up with the church. I'm going to learn more about Jesus. And I'm going to follow Him and do exactly what He does. Hallelujah. Those of y'all that are sick in your body, been given a bad report, you just believe Jesus' report. By His report, He says, I am healed. So confess that. I am healed. A body line up with the Word of the living God. Amen. Man, we love y'all so much and we'll see you soon. Have a great night, and we'll, we'll, we'll be talking to you again on Sunday. But until then, stay close to Jesus and close to His Word. Remember to read your Bible every day, pray every day, seek His holy face, and He'll tell you what to do. Amen.